So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. I so thank you for making us part of your day. I know you're busy people out there listening to podcasts, doing all you're doing, running around your kids. I understand that. I'm a pediatrician, but I thank you for making us part of your day. And uh, I will tell you that if you like what you hear, I will ask you to please send it out to your friends. Uh, we're trying to build an audience, and the people I bring before you on a weekly basis are remarkable people. And today is a, it's a great joy to have um, an author. Uh, he is a, an accomplished uh, gentleman. He's done a lot. He's written books. He, um, he has a PhD from uh, University of San Francisco Medical School. Uh, he is now on staff at UCLA in the School of Medicine. He is also the head of the Center for Latino Health and Culture. And he is also on the board of directors of the Southern California Historical Society. Uh, David, uh, David Bautista, David Hayes Bautista, you are a remarkable man. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Hamilton Review. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I like to have my guests tell a little bit about uh, their lives, a little bit about them. And um, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to you and just kind of share with everyone a little bit about your background, where you're from, uh, what mm -hmm. were the motivating things that, that uh, caused you to do what you're doing today? Okay. Well, I'm uh, actually a native Angelino. I was born here in Los Angeles, actually down in San Pedro, uh, down in the harbor. My dad was in the Navy in World War II. So that was home for me. Uh, raised in... Um, Boyle Heights, El Monte, until age 10, uh, sorry, 88. Uh, my dad was a highway engineer, so we left LA where I had a large extended family, still do, and we moved to San Luis Obispo where I was there for two years. And then from there, we moved up to a little tiny town 40 miles north of Sacramento called Yuba City. And that was a big change from Los Angeles, let me tell you. Uh, from a city of three and a half million to a city of 3,000. <laughs> so I grew up in rural California and went off to school and I went to UC Davis. And back then, this is 1963, there was almost no diversity on the UC campuses. Uh, I was the entering class of 63 at Davis. There were about, there were exactly two African American students. There were a half a dozen Asian students, and as far as I could tell, I was the only Latino. And I was studying engineering. I'm a STEM guy. Oh, well, I got kind of lonely after a while, and finally somebody mentioned, hey, there are 25 Chicanos at Berkeley. So we went down one weekend to check it out, and sure enough, there were 25 Chicanos. So I transferred to uh, UC Berkeley. <clears throat> and four of us have actually continued working together now for almost 60 years. Well, in fact, we recently wrote a book about that experience. Uh, it was the early days of the Chicano movement that was very invigorating. Um, that was the third world strike at Berkeley to try to get ethnic studies established, and it was dismissed as being something political. However, I bring those insights into my medical research today, as there is a huge need for them. That's why I established my center. After, uh, while I was uh, still an undergraduate, I got involved in East Oakland, and I wound up being the uh, founding executive director of La Clinica de la Raza in East Oakland. Uh, we were a bunch of students, Berkeley, UCSF, and we had big visions. We were going to bring health services where none existed at the time. We were going to bring them in Spanish, and we were going to bring them for free, and we had all of $240. So we started, <laughs> and we opened up. And I'm happy to say that 55 years later, La Clinica is still there, <clears throat> one of the largest providers in Alameda Contra Costa County. Well, from there, well, way, uh, David, I have to interrupt you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Way back then, 250 bucks was a lot of money. Yeah, but it wasn't millions. It was probably worth about maybe 2,500 today. <laughs> uh, so imagine trying to start a health clinic on $2,500. Yeah. But we did it, and we weren't the only one. There were hundreds of similar clinics up and down the state uh, established at that time. Then I uh, went to UCSF, and I was 
uh, studying in the basic sciences, I'm primarily a demographer, epidemiologist. Uh, just to clarify, I'm not a clinical. I'm a researcher. We do the basic science research. And one of the things that uh, frustrated me when I was director of La Clinica is that I'm an engineer. So I like data. And so I, now I'm in charge of a clinic that I had to build from the ground up. We had almost no money. My first question was, okay, so how many Latinos live in East Oakland? And nobody knew because Latinos weren't counted in the census at that time. So, okay, so what are the major health issues? Nobody oh, hold knew. On, hold on, let me, yes. let, me, let me clarify that. You say Latinos were not counted? I mean, you're saying they weren't counted or they were in, included was, in a different group? There was no uh, specific identification for Latinos in the census. You had racial identifications, white, black, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, et cetera, but not Latino okay. or Hispanic or any other okay. thing. Yeah. Um, so what were the health issues? Again, nobody knew because there was not that Hispanic identifier in the health records. Well, as an engineer, I'm thinking, well, this is crazy. How can you build an institution when you don't know who's going to be there or what they need? But I guess the needs were so many. Whatever we did, we met some needs. So it was a very successful beginning. But I was frustrated by the lack of data because the engineer in me says to do something, you need to know what you're going to do. Sure. So that's why I took my engineering training over to UCSF and became a primarily a demographer epidemiologist. And then as soon as I graduated, I was recruited by UC Berkeley to the School of Public Health, where I published my first paper beginning in 1973 and have continued ever since. While at Berkeley, I became somewhat of a futurist and I wrote my very first book, started writing it in 1980, right after the 1980 census, which was the first one that actually counted and identified Hispanics so that I could find out, well, how many are there and what's their income and how big are their families and everything else. So I wrote my very first book and it was uh, eventually published by Stanford University Press in 1987 that I started in 1981. As I looked at patterns, uh, it was clear to me that the Latino population was set for a huge wave of growth and nobody was looking at it. So that's what I wrote. And it wasn't just simply that the Latino population was going to grow. Uh, the Latino population was quite, uh, quite a bit younger than other populations and quite a bit younger than the non-Hispanic white baby boomers. And what I could see is that as the largely non-Hispanic white baby boomers started to retire by 21, that's when young Latinos would be pouring into the labor force. And basically Latinos, young Latino workers would be paying for the social security and Medicare of the baby boomers. Yep. And I projected... And I started this in 1981. I projected that by 2030, there would be 15.2 million Latinos in California. Well, we're 15.5 and we're six years early, but I pretty much hit every decennial census right on the head. I'm a pretty good methodologist. So <laughs> after writing that book, UCLA got interested. So I um, was recruited down to UCLA and I have continued working and I started noticing that Latinos have really unique health patterns. Um, and so I wrote another book on this, which came out in 2004, uh, called La Nueva California, Latinos in California. And I pointed out the epidemiology that as we look at causes of death, say heart disease, cancer, stroke, Latinos have on an age adjusted basis, 30% lower death rate compared to non-Hispanic whites for almost every cause of death, accidents, chronic lower respiratory disease, et cetera. Now that's amazing because the models I was taught were that Latinos should have a higher death rate because they have less income, less access to care, less insurance, et cetera. Latinos have a life expectancy that's three years longer than non-Hispanic white, have lower infant mortality, smoke less, drink less, and do drugs less. All of this contrary to the stereotypes that you hear about Latinos, but this yeah. is in the data, the birth data, the hospital utilization data, the death data. So I wrote a book on all of that, and I actually looked at data from 1940 to the year 2000, a 60-year period. I also picked up some behavioral characteristics such as labor force participation, and it turns out in that 60-year period, Latinos had the highest rate of labor force participation of any group, worked more hours per week than any group, worked more in the private sector than any group, used welfare less than any group, had stronger families than any group, 
Um, so these were not the sorts of things that I was hearing people talk about Latinos doing, even in the research world. That's why yeah. I wrote that book in 2004. Well, you, I, really were, you really were kind of shattering <clears throat> some of the, uh, the, the ideas and maybe the, the misperceptions uh, of, of a lot of people who were not looking at, the, at this population. I mean, certainly I think that from my experience, and I think everyone knows that um, I married a, a woman who uh, does have uh, a Mexican heritage. And so that is something that has been very obvious to me from the very beginning, yeah. uh, is that this group of people is very, very, first, certainly very hardworking. I can see that. Uh, and I think that the, the I think the health knowledge that you're sharing here is a little bit of a I, I didn't know some of that information, but that's interesting. What mm -hmm. was the reception when you when you uh, published that data? Well, uh, there tended to be two types of receptions, just as when I published my first book saying that Latinos would be 40 percent of California, um, just total disbelief and dismissal. And that can never happen. Um, but I'm a researcher and the situation for me is I believe in doing good science. You have to have a theoretical model that predicts results. You have to have your data and you have to make them available. People should be able to replicate what you find. And what has been bothering me ever since that book came out, that was 2004, almost 20 years now, is how many people don't bother to use data. They jump to conclusions based on what they heard on the news. And sometimes these are researchers that do that, and certainly policy types. And you know, the engineer in me and says, you can't do that. You know, if you're going to build a bridge, you need to know what the soil underneath is like. Is it rock? Is it dirt? Is it mud? And you have to change your building accordingly. The foundations are very important, or the bridge is going to fall down. And yet, when it comes to Latinos, people just don't look at the data. Yeah. So that is what why I do what I do. Uh, the reason why I got into history is I was writing that book in 2004. The reason why I used 1940 as my start date is first it was close to when I was born. So this basically was a chronicle of California society during my life. But also the data were electronic. All the earlier censuses had been turned into digitized data so I could put them in a, a computer and start doing runs on them. But there was no computerized data prior to 1940. And I had a question in my mind that started to arose as I was writing that book, which was, so what were Latinos like in 1939? I mean, these are unique patterns that nobody expected. So yeah. when did they start? And as I read California history, um, I got the same picture. The picture was a long time ago, there were some Spanish here. They built the missions all by themselves. Along comes the gold rush and they just kind of disappear. And you never hear of Latinos until about 1920. Well, the demographer in me says that is highly unlikely, highly unlikely. And that's when I realized, well, I could tell you when the Spanish got here. I could tell you when Father Serra got here. I could not tell you when the Mexicans got here. I didn't mm -hmm. know. And nobody could tell me. And it really bothered me. Wait a minute, here we have a unique population, really unique patterns of behavior and health. I want to go back and see how far I can trace it. And now they're telling me there was nobody here. So I did what I do, data. I have a very good team here at UCLA, and I'm used to using large data sets, the census, hospital discharge data, you name it. We had to create our own data sets, and we did that by going back to the censuses starting the day that L.A. was born, there were the Spanish colonial censuses from 1781 to 1821, then the Mexican censuses from 1821 to 1848, then the gold rush happens, California becomes a state, so then we have the U.S. census every 10 years, 1850, 60, 70, 80. Right. They did not have the Hispanic identifier in any of those census, but I know how... Hispanics are identified in the census today. I've been working with that ever since the 1980 census. So what, what, this, what is that? How, how is that, by the way? Well, <clears throat> today, you are <clears throat> Hispanic if you raise your hand and say, I am Hispanic. Yeah. Now, prior to 1980, while they didn't ask people if they were Hispanic or not, they would postcode the data by 
Did you speak Spanish? So if you yeah. spoke Spanish, you would be considered a Hispanic. And or, depending on the census, did you have a Spanish surname? Was your name Rodriguez? And or were you of Spanish origin, which was a little bit loosey-goosey, but like where was your family from? Right. They had used these in the 1940, 50, 60, and 70 census. So while we didn't know how many Hispanics there were, we knew how many people spoke Spanish. But not every Latino speaks Spanish. So, you know, that's not a complete count. So, but we use those because I know how these things are done. And we looked at the handwritten census returns for Los Angeles beginning September 4, 1781, the day that LA was born. And I can tell you now, you know, when the Mexicans got here, who they were, what age they were, where they were born in Mexico for every single census ever since. We have the data. I've done so tell us here. when, so tell us, uh, uh, doctor, when did they come? When, when did the, I mean, it seems like they were here all the time in my mind. I mean, I, but I, but I'm curious, what, what, how would you answer that question? Oh, the date was April 29th, 1769. There's actually a day because it turns out uh, that uh, called the Portola expedition that came in 1769. Sure. Yeah. There were about 300 people in that of which maybe 20 were Spanish from Spain. Yep. The rest were Indians from Mexico, Africans, one Asian, and mestizos and mulatos, primarily from uh, Sinaloa and Sonora. And they were uh, paid by the King of Spain to move their families here to Los Angeles and set up the civilian uh, population of the Pueblo of Los Angeles and to start getting involved in economic activities to feed the soldiers and the missions and everything else. So I'm writing the civil history, not the mission history, not the religious history, but the civil history of that population. And I know who married whom. We have all these in our data set, how many kids they have, what they did. And I've been, I have now completed the data. I'm writing a demographic history of Latinos in Los Angeles from September 4th, 1781 to 2020. Amazing. Data for that complete period. And Latinos never disappeared. In fact, the period of largest growth was the gold rush. It was a huge amount of growth. Uh, the Latino population went from about 10,000 in 1848 to over 100,000 by 1860 in just one decade. Well, wow. I'm published. I have a book coming out this fall on that. It's called, uh, it's being published by the University of New Mexico Press. It's called The Latino Big Bang, colon, a Mexican 49er eyewitness, 1849, 1850. I found in Mexico City uh, about 15 years ago, a diary, a handwritten diary, the only known diary written by a Mexican 49er. He left Guadalajara in February of 1849, came to California, was here for about 18 months, very cognizant of the fact that just seven months earlier, California had been part of Mexico. Hmm. Then he went back to Guadalajara, died, estates were sold. I, by accident, I came across his diary. Easy. So we've translated it. Yep. And I've given it the context. This is why I call it the Big Bang. There was this huge population explosion during the gold rush. In fact, a lot of Latino miners got here in 1848, not in 1849 that they were often called the 48ers by the later arriving 49ers who came from the East Coast. So we should we should retell we should rename the uh football team up there in, in the Bay Area the 48ers, I suppose, right? No, no, a soccer team, yes. Well, football <laughs> the 49ers. <laughs> All right. Uh, That's amazing. So you and you have all this data that you've collected. So yeah. um so that that does you you kind of segue into your um, your your story about your what your your early days and just you know realizing though there was a, a Chicano culture going on for a long time and now you you kind of broadened it to really the whole Southern California historical uh, picture here and and now you're the member you're on a, the board of directors of the Santa Monica, of the Southern California Historical Society um, is that so you kind of came into the historical society a little bit later on in your career. 
Yes, I was not trained as an historian, but I am trained in theory, method, and data. And I'm yeah. just I've taken my interests in all of that backwards in time. Remember, in 1980, I did it forwards in time. I was a futurist. Now I'm an historian. Uh, but I've covered the period from 1781 to 2020 pretty thoroughly in terms of data. Amazing. I'm telling the stories that the data tell me. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to take a one minute break here, um, Dr. Hayes Bautista. We're going to come back and, and uh, talk about. I want. I want to, uh, as you know, the the subtitle of my show is where kids and culture collide. And I want to, I want to ask you a couple of questions about kids and about uh, the importance of history. And so, uh, with that in mind, friends, uh, we are taking a short break. We will be right back. You're listening to the Hamilton Review. The Hamilton Review podcast is brought to you by Hamilton Babies, nine kid-friendly products designed for the little loves in your life. Find them at hamiltonbabies.com or amazon.com. Also consider Dr. Hamilton's recently published book, Seven Secrets of the Newborn, available at Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, and amazon.com. So friends, welcome back to the Hamilton Review. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. David Hayes Bautista. He is a PhD. Uh, he is on staff at UCLA School of Medicine and now on the, the board of directors of the Southern California Historical Society. David, I, I, I'm going to ask you a, uh, to do something almost impossible, and that is to give a little bit of a thumbnail sketch, because LA, it turns out, is a very young, young place. The whole Southern California uh, relatively speaking, the the history obviously goes back uh, to way back into the seven the eighteenth century, I suppose. But the the explosion of LA and what has happened in Los Angeles County is truly amazing in all of Southern California. But if you can, can you give us a little bit of a thumbnail sketch, uh, the big picture of Southern California history? Well, uh, you have to remember this was indigenous. And Mexico is indigenous, by and large. And something I just need to make a little corrective. Uh, we hear about the Spanish, how 400 Spanish conquered an empire of 25 million. That is not what happened. That's what the Spaniards said happened. But that's not what happened. Read the indigenous accounts. In fact, 80% of Mexican indigenous were never conquered. <laughs> okay. They were already fighting uh, Tenochtitlan. Cortez came along, they invited him along, they did the grunt work, and they had been fighting the Aztecs for my town for 100 years. So that about half of the folks that came from Mexico to California on April 29th, 1769, were already indigenous. There were Christianized indigenous. Most of them didn't speak much Spanish. They spoke indigenous languages. And the local Indian language here is a relative language. It's all part of the Udo Aztec language of families. So if we look at the indigenous narrative, actually LA has been around for about 1500 years. Yeah. Okay. So this was just the latest wave and there had been different waves of indigenous coming in to what's now the LA area. The Tongavit replaced an earlier, uh, I believe they were Paiute speaking group. Um, so in many ways, just another group of Indians arrived into LA in 1781. Only the Indians that just arrived brought Western society so that they wore shoes, they had clothing, they carried uh, firearms, they had hoes, they had oxen. So that was the difference between the indigenous who had lived here prior to then and the ones that arrived. There's actually a group of indigenous that brought Western society, and there was a lot of interaction between yeah. the local indigenous and the ones that had just arrived. So it wasn't like there was a complete cutoff. And, and they intermarried, they worked together. And this is not the story you hear from the missions, but this it's a different story. It's about the civilians. So in many ways, LA is about almost 2,000 years old. Uh, we have good records of the past 270 years, but there are records out there and oral memories out there. Uh, I know a number of Tongavit. Uh, I've done some work together with them. And we also work with indigenous from Mexico who are out in auction. I was picking strawberries today. This is a fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinating picture. In many ways, that's sort of the background of 
California in general. Now, remember, I'm an engineer. I'm a, a great believer in theory, method, and data. I'm a STEM person. I'm a nerd, however you want to put it. Uh, but <laughs> humans do science. Humans do research. And so humans will sometimes project onto the world that which they think they already know, such as these narratives about Latinos being illegal immigrants and drug lords and everything else. I prefer to look at the data. So I do believe in the university's mission, triple mission of research, teaching, and public service. I was seeing a different narrative bubble up out of the uh, demographic data that I was collecting, and I wanted to share it with the local shaper of our regional narrative, which is the Historic Society of Southern California. And I had a, for me, uh, a particular case I wanted to make, which is this. All my life, when I was born and raised here in California, we've celebrated Cinco de Mayo. I'm sure you've heard of it, Dr. Hamilton. Sure. Okay. Uh, when I was a university student, I was going to Mexico. And I just happened to be in Mexico, in Guadalajara, on a Cinco de Mayo. This would be in the 70s, very early 70s. And I thought, wow, I'm going to see the best Cinco de Mayo ever. So on the morning of Cinco de Mayo, about 1972, three thereabouts, I ran out of the house and my cousin saying, hey, where are you going? I'm going to see the Cinco de Mayo. And I thought I heard them saying, what? But I went downtown, sat in front of the cathedral. I wanted to get the best seat. And I waited for the parade. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited, <laughs> and nothing happened. So I went back, and they said, so what did you do all day? I waited for the Cinco de Mayo. We don't do that. They said, but you guys up there, you do it. We don't do it. <laughs> I said, oh, that's right. We've been doing it. And I mean, we instituted it at Berkeley, and after the Third World Strike, we celebrated the first, if you will, Chicano Cinco de Mayo at the Greek Theater with the Salsa concert. Go figure. We didn't know exactly why, but we celebrated it. But we didn't know why, in particular, because I spent a lot of time in Mexico. I know it's not celebrated in Mexico. Well, I discovered the reason as I was doing my demographic research, because one of my sources for data, births, deaths, and marriages, were the Spanish language newspapers that were published here in LA beginning 1851. So as I was pulling out the data, I would have to read the entire issue because they weren't very standardized. Where were the announcements of births, deaths, and marriages? And I wound up reading about the Civil War, about John Brown marching on Harper's Ferry, uh, about the Confederate guns opening on Fort Sumter. And I'm reading this in Spanish, by the way. Hmm. Then I'm reading about the Triple Alliance arrives in Mexico in December, January of 1862. And then the Brit British and the Spanish peel off. The French decide to march into Mexico City. And this is early 1862, demanding that Mexico pay some past due bills. And I'm reading day by day as the French get closer and closer and closer. And remember, remember, I'm also looking just for the demographic data, births, marriages, and deaths. But I'm reading letters and accounts and dispatches from Mexico at the time, published sure. in 1862. Mm -hmm. And finally, the French are only about a week's march away from Mexico City. This is done. We're going to be in Mexico City in a week. We're bringing the Emperor Maximilian. Uh, he'll be now the emperor. He'll make a deal with the Confederates and the Civil War and the US will be over because Confederacy will be recognized. But they never made it to Mexico. They got stopped dead at the Battle of Puebla. Puebla, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, 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 on the Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. So Latinos here in California had already been involved with the Civil War for over um, a year. And the issues that Latinos brought, by the way, that uh, many ways started the Civil War because we had been part of Mexico. When Mexico declared independence in 1810, Mexico abolished slavery, and they were very serious about it. Uh, Hidalgo was going to give the slave owners 10 days to free their slaves, or he was going to put the owners in jail. He was serious about it. They also abolished racial discrimination that had been practiced by the Spanish and announced democracy. So that was what Latinos were familiar with, because I'll California's part of Mexico, these are the constitutional values. When the U.S. Constitution arrived in 1849, the U.S. Constitution was very different because the U.S. Constitution protected slavery where it existed, denied non-white citizenship, and was very much built on elitist plantation rule. So when the Civil War broke out, it was clear to the Latinos, we need to support Lincoln. 
because he's fighting for freedom, equality, and democracy. When the French were going to invade Mexico, this really upset Latinos uh, because they thought, well, if Mexico falls and Maximilian is installed, Maximilian was a good friend of the Confederates. Mm. He could ship them arms. He could just <laughs> recognize them as an independent nation. And the Civil War would have been over with slavery and white supremacy intact. That's well, why when news of the Battle of Puebla arrived here in California, it just had such an electrifying effect on Latinos. Sure. Freedom, so, equality, so I, democracy are saved. So I didn't really realize that the 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 really the reason why it was such a celebrated thing is it had to do with the the civil war in the United States and the the alliance that could have been that would have probably ensued had the French won that battle. Right. And uh, that's fascinating to me. OK, mm -hmm. you just taught me something very okay. interesting. Well, yeah. Latinos here, because remember, you had close to 100,000 Latinos, the entire population of California is about 300,000. Yeah. In 129 cities in California, Nevada, and Oregon organized a local uh, political society called the Junta Patriotica Mexicana. They would meet every month and raise funds to send to Mexico for what is kind of like we're sending arms to Ukraine right now to buy arms to fight the French. They would uh, list the name of everybody in a particular city, let's say Stockton. You had a Junta Patriotica in Stockton uh, every month. And these lists would be published in the newspapers. That's part of our database, how we knew who was here, when, how much they donated, and why. So that began the celebration of Cinco de Mayo. And the reason why it's not celebrated in Mexico is that the French came back a year later, laid siege to Puebla. It took them two and a half months. They finally, Puebla ran out of food, water, and ammunition, and the French were able to take it. Then they marched to Mexico City. Then they installed the emperor, but it was too late for the Confederacy. At that point, the Confederates were already uh, waning. The Battle of Gettysburg had happened in the middle of all of that. So it didn't do the Confederates any good. Had they won at Puebla a year ago, it may have done some very serious damage to us today in the United States. Well, well. So my cousins and colleagues then tell me in Mexico, well, we don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo because they came back. And then they did conquer us. And then we had the fight for another five years. But it was just the Cinco de Mayo, the Battle of Puebla was experienced here by Latinos as their experience of the American Civil War. Yeah. And we started celebrating it big then, and we have celebrated it ever since. We've forgotten why, so it's become kind of a beer party, you know, drink with a mayo and everything else. But at its heart, it had to do with issues that we're still arguing about today. Freedom, equality, and democracy versus slavery, white supremacy, and elitist plantation rule. Same. Yeah. <clears throat> Same things. So, um, fascinating. Um, let me ask you another question. So um, we, I mentioned before the break that uh, my subtitle is Where Kids and Culture Collide. Dr. Hayes Bautista, why is it important to teach kids history? Well, it's who we are. I did not know why we celebrated the Cinco de Mayo. And here's the funny part. Every family has its stories. <laughs> and since I was a little kid, I heard the story about how my great, 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 great grandfather fought at the Battle of Puebla. And I was given the story in a whole bunch of detail. But, you know, that's down there, Puebla. You know, hello, we were up here at the time. Uh, I didn't, you know, it didn't spark anything in me until I found this history. Then suddenly, I realized, oh, my God, I have an ancestor there at the Battle of Puebla. Um, and it has this effect on a lot of people who understand we were here a long time ago. We were fighting for issues that are still important today. And that helps me understand what is my role here? Uh, why am I doing what I'm doing? What is my own personal vision and narrative? Just to understand better the history of LA. Yeah. And I, and I think that's why, I, I mean, when I think about history, <laughs> I think about kids and uh, the value, because we, we don't really, I mean, history is something that we don't really use um, that we don't really teach our kids that well. And I, and I know that because I sometimes in my pediatric office, just for the heck of it, when I have teenagers walk in, I will ask them, tell me about this event. What does this event mean to you? What is today? Like even Martin Luther King, you know, holiday. What, what, is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, there are a lot of kids don't know. They can't give me an articulate answer mm -hmm. on that. Oh, don't worry. Uh, I teach one undergraduate course because I think it's important to stay in touch with undergraduates. Yeah. 
And today, when I ask who was Cesar Chavez, they say, oh, the boxer, great, great record, you know, 25 knockouts. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, okay, uh, we need a little bit of history here. How about Cesar Chavez, the farm worker organizer? But yeah. I can't blame them. Can't blame them. Nobody tells them that. No, nobody has found them. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I think that, that that's why I, does, I think it does give you a context of who we are as a people, who we are mm -hmm. as a, as yeah. a culture. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's kind of why I wanted you to, to you know to be on this show with me today, uh, David. I, I have another question, and, and I want to I want to kind of finish up with this. Um, mm -hmm. You're the head of the Center for uh, for the for Latino Health and Culture over there at UCLA Medical School mm -hmm. School of Medicine. What exactly are you looking at over there in your in your department? What what are the things that you're analyzing right now? The major research question that we have been researching for nearly 40 years is why do Latinos with much less income, education, and access to care have fewer heart attacks, fewer cancers, fewer strokes, and live three years longer than non-Hispanic whites? Why? What are Latinos doing that reduces your risk for heart disease? So I, so <clears throat> you answer the question, and after 40 years, you must have some in uh, idea what what the answer is. So what I'm going to let you answer your own question. Well, actually, I do not have an answer to that question because you see, I'm an engineer, so I need numbers. I need to know that this has, you know, some unit of effect on that. And we're not there yet with this. All I know is there's this outcome that surprises people is not predicted by any model we use in medical research. And I invite my students along, even though I don't have the answer. Here is what I've learned in the past 40 years researching this question. Let me share what I have learned. And let's go together ahead and see if eventually, one of these days, we finally find the answer. Yeah. Do you, do you have a hunch? I, I, won't, I won't ask you. I will ask you to take off your engineering hat for a second and, and ask you between you and I, do you have a hunch uh, why that may be? Because I, I have a hunch. But I, I wanna, I wanna, I'll share with my... My hunch after you share your hunch. My hunch is based on, and it's very important for my hunch that we know where we come from. We know our history. It has to do with community of narratives. That is, people who share a, um, a common past in some fashion, who talk about it. They don't have to agree on it, but they talk about how to live life, where do we come from, what are we doing, why are we here? And somewhere in that, and there's always the grandmother effect, I talk about with the Latino families a little bit humorously, um, but grandmothers are always there, you know, tell you, do this, don't do that, unless you want to get sick. There may be some wisdom there. Uh, so I'm looking at community of narrative, and I'm trying to figure out how do you measure narrativity? It's not genetic, it's not language, it's not food, <clears throat> but there's something there. We don't yeah. get random variation. We get very specific and very unexpected patterns, and they're very stable. Haven't changed over the 40 years I've been looking at them. So the engineer in me says there has to be a, a rational, logical explanation, but we just need to ask different questions. Yeah. Obviously, the questions we're asking have nothing to do with it. So my, my hunch is that uh, the word community is uh, absolutely my, the, this, the core of it, too. I think that my observation of Latino families, and I have many of them in my practice, are that they have a, they have a big family. They also have a tendency to be, they have kids. They, the family unit in, in the Latino culture is a very critical part of their, their life. And I think that, um, and definitely that that whole idea of friendships and relationships is one of the most important things in terms of, and we know this from many many studies that that uh, obviously you got to you have to eat good, you have to have you have good food, you have to, you know, you can't smoke, can't drink, can't get, you know, all these other things are important to health, exercise, all that kind of stuff, education. But I think that there, you know, definitely there are a lot of studies out there showing that relationships and family are really a very, very important thing in longevity and overall uh, health in general. So I, mm -hmm. that's my hunch, but uh, I'll let you, a uh, scientist, uh, either verify or uh, throw out my, my thinking. We're not taking point. anything off the table. We're also looking at the effects of dancing, looking at the effects of 
uh, tacos, you name it, uh, tortillas. <laughs> we're, we're not taking anything off the table just yet. All right. Well, I'm eating a lot of tacos in my house. So I want you to know that I'm doing okay. my best. All right. Very good. All right. Well, listen, um, Dr. David uh, Hayes Bautista, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for taking the time to come uh, on the Hamilton Review. Where can people find you? Uh, we have a web page. Uh, just our, our initials are CESLAC, Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture, UCLA School of Medicine, and it'll come up. And you can find our studies and announcements of things, events, performances that we're doing, presentations, et okay. cetera. And you're also <clears throat> available through the Southern California Historical Society as well. Yes. Uh, is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Well, listen, my friend, you're a, a delight to talk with. Uh, keep up the good work. You're an amazing person. Uh, so, friends, we have we have had a conversation today with Dr. David uh, Hayes Bautista. And uh, David, again, thank you for making the time to be here. Okay, my pleasure. And All friends, right. and, and and friends, until next time, be be well and be safe. Bye bye. You have been listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.